Good morning to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to Mexico Now for the invite. My name is Fabiola Aguilar, and I am in charge of the automotive cluster of Coahuila. Today, we have three panelists that represent the automotive clusters of Chihuahua, State of Mexico, and San Luis Potosí, mm -hmm. who will be talking about the strategy for the automobile cluster in the regions, what is now and what will be implemented. Well, welcome Alejandro Veraza, director of the automotive cluster of San Luis Potosí. Thank you, Fabiola. Good morning to everybody. Thank you, Alejandro, for being here. Uh, we are accompanied by Tarcicio Carreón, president of the Automobile Cluster of Chihuahua. Tarcicio, thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Good morning, everybody. And uh, Gunter Barajas, president of the Advan Advanced Manufacturing of the Automobile Cluster of the State of Mexico. You, Gunter, thank you for being here. Thank you, Fabiola. Thank you very much. Okay. Before starting with the panel, I'm going to briefly talking, talk about a, a cluster, uh, what a cluster does and what it's for. Well, um, in the idea world, all companies, small, medium, and big ones from a region or a country can communicate perfectly and generate ties in supply chains to make the entire business state within the region and generate more jobs and wealth. In a world, this company also communicate perfectly with the academy and research centers together, so together generate more knowledge. In an real world, uh, companies can communicate with government officials so they know and uh, understand from the first hand needs and support required in the sector to be more competitive. But that only happened in an real world. In reality, communication between these players is poor because there are barriers that inhibit communication and therefore collaboration between them. One of the big barriers for this collaboration is a low amount of trust. A cluster is dedicated to build communication bridges and collaboration between the industry. In our case of, e of the cluster, build this communication and collaboration bridges to generate strategy and regional action for the automotive industry in Mexico. In our, in our country, there are 10 auto, automotive clusters, each of them building bridges in the region and via the national cluster network, we are building collaboration bridge regions. And in my case, I, I lead the automotive cluster of Coahuila. We started back in January, 2019 and associate companies uh, and associated companies are now collaborating in four different topics human resources innovation and industry 4.0 operation and social responsibility currently we have 18 companies affiliated thank you very much uh, then alejandro alejandro veraza will tell us about the automotive cluster of san Luis potosí alejandro go ahead please yeah good morning um, maybe we can start with the presentation. Now, I don't want to go through the presentation. I just want to talk about uh, what a cluster is and what we have uh, available as resources, not only to the cluster in SLP, but to, to all clusters in, in Mexico. Uh, well, we based our philosophy in working together with the government, working together with the academy, that means universities and, and major colleges in the region, but mainly our work is with and within the automotive industry in not only in SLP, but the entire region. Uh, we are kind of a, a promoter in, in the region so that we can fuel up all the uh, economy with the automotive industry uh, as the main driver in SLP. Uh, we know that San Luis Potosí is a state that is not only geographically situated because it's in the middle of everything in Mexico, but it's also a state that is uh, very young in terms of uh, its automotive industry and with the potential to grow not only uh, every year, but almost every month. Uh, keep going, please. Uh, we are represented here by the government with uh, 
the main leader of the Secretary of uh, Economic Development, who is Mr. Um, Gustavo Puente. And we are also represented by, by the industry. Our president is Mr. Gunta Daut, uh, who is also heading Bosch uh, as a vice president of our commercial affairs in, in SLP. Keep going, please. Uh, we add value, and, and that is main, the main key activity to add value. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, worth to be within the automotive uh, industry. And the proposal of value added uh, from the automotive cluster is to make all uh, to make all the new um, strategies and to make all the new requirements not only available for the industry, but also to make the industry join those strategies and those requirements to be ahead of the game. Okay, please keep going. So we are gathering not only uh, the industry, but also the other um, clusters, automotive clusters in Mexico, so the whole network that Fabiola has already mentioned, and together with that network with uh, the government, the local government, and with the national associations for the automotive industry, we grow uh, together within the region, within the state, and within Mexico. Please keep going. So, so far, um, as everybody in Mexico, we have had these two major challenges uh, throughout the year, and we expect to have uh, succeeded so far, um, I think that proudly we in SLP started after the COVID shutdown, we started the industry in a record time, less than three weeks, and all industries, all companies were already working after three weeks uh, from the restart of operations. Not 100% that we know that at least all the industry was working three weeks after we restarted operations in June. And so far with the UMSCA or the TEMEC as we call it in Mexico, we have empowered all uh, industries to get all the information, not only to get the information, but also to fulfill the requirements uh, for 2020 uh, within the new uh, North American trade agreement. Okay, so we will keep going uh, throughout this year and next year uh, with an action plan. We had uh, several activities and just please go in one, don't stop in these ones. Uh, throughout the year, each month we have organized and we have developed several uh, actions uh, within SLP, which have gone together with the other uh, automotive clusters in Mexico, but also within the automotive industry of SLP. So far to SLP, um, we will come back later with any questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Our second panelist is Tarcicio Carreón who is going to talk about the automotive cluster of Chihuahua. Tarcicio, go ahead, please. Okay, so um, Chihuahua's automotive cluster is uh, uh, an entity that is um, uh, formed by, by the, some of the automotive companies uh, located in Chihuahua City. Can you go next, please? And uh, uh, I am uh, specifying the Chihuahua City because uh, we are uh, starting to grow, but yet we have not covered the entire state. So uh, we have right now in the state 39 automotive companies with several uh, facilities. Uh, some of them have uh, four or five facilities, but the, the mission of this uh, organization is to promote and develop the automotive industry in the state. Um, is uh, in reality uh, uh, that, that the mission, not only of the cluster or the industry, but is uh, um, a four party association, which is uh, government, academia, or academy, industry and society. In terms of uh, society, we have uh, obviously uh, the main representation in our employees. And uh, the, the vision is to achieve a, a sustainable and internationally recognized cluster. Why is this? 
because we are in a globalized uh, market now and um, everything it has uh, become a really connected uh, worldwide with the new technologies and the, with the new uh, methods of uh, uh, marketing our products and, and the companies also. So we are an integrator and developer of the supply chains for the automotive industry and focus in the region of Chihuahua. Uh, uh, in Chihuahua, we have uh, 32,000 uh, jobs uh, direct employment jobs uh, related to the industry. And this is uh, almost 36% uh, of the state uh, employment. So it's uh, really, really important in the state. Okay, can you move to the next one, please? So this is a, a quick uh, picture of uh, how the companies are distributed. Uh, we have uh, one OEM in the city, which is uh, the Ford Motor Company Engines Plant. We have uh, 15 Tier 1 companies. We have 13 Tier 2. And we have three Tier 3 companies. So this is uh, how they are distributed in terms of the supply chain structure. Okay. Can you move to the next one, please? So uh, the cluster uh, right now uh, has 22 companies out of the 39 and uh, uh, the plan managers and uh, strategic allies are, are the ones that uh, form the, the council of the, of the uh, uh, cluster. And uh, what we do basically is just uh, have a, a, a forum and a way to communicate the challenges of the industry develop uh, joint uh, strategies and, and in order to benefit uh, uh, all the members of the cluster, but not only that, but uh, the society as well. We provide uh, a, a way to, to uh, uh, create a synergy between government and, and all the parties that we were mentioning before. Okay. Next. So how, the, uh, how does the cluster uh, work or how is the structure? We have uh, five key areas, which is uh, integration where we have a supply chain committee uh, in terms of uh, uh, understand how Chihuahua and the, uh, and the companies that uh, belong to the cluster um, uh, can provide or contribute to the automotive industry, uh, not only locally, but worldwide, and understand uh, 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 how is the uh, impact that we do in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, supply chain. So uh, we have also a technology and development committee where we can uh, define and provide uh, answers to our members, uh, provide guidance in order to either uh, get a direct answer from uh, some of the members and uh, some help or find the proper source for it. And we have an education committee where we identify the needs, the local needs uh, of the companies uh, related to uh, the schools and the, uh, in general, the academy system. Uh, here we have a direct uh, uh, contact and participation of, of, of the local schools and the membership committee where we uh, foresee the growth of the cluster in terms of uh, uh, the companies that can join us and uh, or um, key, uh, key members that we want to join the cluster, not only uh, direct companies, uh, suppliers also, and uh, or a, a, a related uh, people to the industry that can bring knowledge and expertise to the cluster. And then the outreach and promotion committee where we uh, obviously uh, look for uh, enforcing those, uh, those links and, 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 and ally um, relationships. Okay. Next one, please. So this is a quick, um, a chart just to show pretty much how uh, 
the dynamic of the cluster in terms of networking is. We do have a, a network. Uh, we have very uh, close relationships with some of the most uh, uh, important associations. We have obviously the, the linkage with the national cluster network. Um, we do have uh, some uh, uh, links to government uh, uh, institutions. We do have a very close relationship with the index and, and uh, the Consejo Coordinador Empresarial, which is uh, the, the pretty much the representation of all the, the companies uh, in, in, in Mexico. So th that, that uh, first uh, level that you see there is a linkage to all the, all the external uh, um, uh, entities that we want to, to, to have uh, contact with. Uh, we have alliances in terms of uh, working together in some efforts. And uh, here, as I was mentioning, part of uh, our cluster is uh, the state government and the, the city uh, government but we do have also some national associations related to the industry um, that uh, uh, are working directly with us as well. And the academy in terms of the main uh, um, uh, institutions that uh, uh, have to be linked to us in terms of uh, the needs of the industry locally, uh, depending on the, on the type of uh, processes that we have in our company. So that's basically the way we work in Chihuahua. Tarcicio, thank you very much for your presentation. Now, close, closing now this presentation rounds, a round with the participation of the automotive cluster of the state of Mexico. The automotive cluster of the state of Mexico is a civil association that is bringing together the main supplier and tier ones that make the value chain of the Mexican automotive industry in the region. Currently, the state of Mexico runs, uh, ranks as the entity with the largest number of suppliers of the auto parts and component in this country. And this is significant because we have from tier ones, tier twos, up to tier three and technology companies as part of, of the automotive cluster. These, uh, this mix of members give us really good strengths and, and, uh, and a very, helpful ecosystem because our vision is to transform the, the automotive industry in Mexico. We were seeing how the, the technology in the automotive industry is changing. So we need to move in, the, in this direction. So what we're doing is uh, we're working in several committees, working uh, mostly with the vision of, of the transformation and development of, of the national automotive industry. And also we're very committed to, to the development, development not only of the industry, but also with the development and well-being of the community. That's why during the, the months of uh, March, April and May, all the committees uh, work together to help CIDESI and CONACYT to develop this uh, uh, ventilator to, to face the, the pandemic. We were almost 15 companies working with CIDESI providing technology in high tech, metal stamping, plastics, uh, electronics, design, on helping them to, to provide this ventilator to, to Mexico. So uh, right now, we, we, we step back because the, the ventilator is already in production and we're coming back now working with the, the state of Mexico government with Mr. Enrique Jacob, our Secretary of Economy, and Ma, Marta Hilda Gonzalez, our Secretary of uh, Labor and Health, on, on looking the solutions on how to keep the automotive industry working in the state of Mexico during these difficult days. Thank you. Gunther, thank you very much for your presentation. Well, uh, before starting with the question and answer session, we have a brief message from the organizer.
Uh, now we will begin with uh, our, our conversation table. Please, Alejandro, Gunter, and Tarcisio, turn on your, your microphone and your camera, please. Thank you, Tarcisio. Thank you, Alejandro. Well, uh, questions, please, through the platform in the question and answer section. Please mention who to the question is addressed to. Uh, let's start, Alejandro. Okay. How is USMCA affecting Mexican automotive industry? Well, let's start by explaining that it is a reviewed uh, deal. I mean, it's not, not a new trade agreement. It's, can you hear me? It's a reviewed deal. No, Alex, and, we have a problem with you audio. No, I think that there's somebody else with ah, that the is, microphone open. Now, now it's good. Fine. Okay. Go ahead. So the point is that the USMA uh, CA deal is in a renovated, renewed uh, trade agreement. It's not a new trade agreement. So as such, uh, we are coming from an era of 25 years, having developed uh, the NAFTA deal um, with a successful result. Now let's put uh, this new agreement or this renewed agreement on our hands. And what we will see is a big opportunity. There's a challenge, of course, everything has a challenge and every new uh, agreement has challenges, but for Mexico is a great opportunity. We are seeing that these new um, requirements that we have in, in the UM, uh, USMCA agreement bring to us an increased uh, uh, value of all the regional production. So what we are uh, now seeing in for the next four years is that we will increase our value added in the region, in the North American region from 60% to 75. That means that we need to produce more parts within the region, North America, and Mexico has the opportunity because of the reduced labor cost compared to North America and to Canada, and the flexibility of many uh, industrial, let's put uh, conditions in Mexico, we have the opportunity to get that extra 15% or almost 15% of the increase in the regional value added content. Okay, so for Mexico, it means a great opportunity to increase our tier ones, tier two, and tier three activities so that we can uh, get to that percentage of value added content. Now, there's another challenge, which is a labor related uh, challenge. And to me, it is also very positive because that will restrict our collaboration with unions and that will make uh, all companies in Mexico, in every level of the automotive industry, be ready with professional uh, labor agreements so that we can not only comply to the Mexican labor law, but also to the North American agreement labor uh, requirements and law. So to Mexico, this is a big opportunity. We have to take it. We have to be able uh, to serve these new uh, requirements of the of the deal of the agreement and come out of 2025 let's say or 2000, uh, 2024 or 2025 with a successful story for mexico so let's open our minds and let's open our uh, ways of working to these new uh, requirements of the of the deal thanks alejandro now, uh, Gunther, what are the main challenge, challenges for the automotive industry in your region, in the states of Mexico? Well, uh, the, the bet we see at the automotive cluster has been always innovation and technological development. Next year, 2021 is going to be a year with multiple challenges and digital technology will be a key element of, uh, of this transformation. And we face something very specific. Because if we want to get more investments, the idea of uh, getting the investment is uh, shifting from where I can find the cheapest labor 
to where I can find the best talent. And this is because all the technology of the uh, shop floors is changing, more technology. So we need to rise how the, the, the new junk uh, uh, operators are going to be working in, in the industry. That's why facing this challenge, the, the automotive cluster of the state of Mexico is working with the Secretary of Economy, with Ernesto, and with multiple uh, members and academia. So we were able to open last year uh, digital lab at the uh, Universidad Tecnológica of, of Tlalnepantla, where the students have the same technology that uses the, the most of the OEMs to design and digital uh, do the digital manufacturing of the vehicle. So we want to provide a higher level of uh, education to, to the new uh, workforce. So we can also rise the bar of the talent that we have in the state of Mexico. And with that, willing to attract more, more high-tech suppliers of the automotive industry. Gunter, thank you very much. Very interesting what uh, you are doing in, in the state of Mexico. And now, Tarcisio, uh, what kind of factors need to be considered at the regional level, given the current situation of the automotive industry? Okay, well, right now the automotive industry is obviously impacted by the COVID situation. Um, and sometimes we get uh, worried about factors uh, uh, that we hear in the news and that, that we wonder how they're gonna behave in the near future. But um, in reality, I would recommend to focus in the factors that you can control. For me, that's the key in terms of the um, companies uh, that's the key and that's what uh, every company has to focus. So I would say that the first factor that, that you have to assess is the uh, local uh, state uh, uh, government restrictions. We have learned that in Chihuahua. Um, as you know, Chihuahua has a specific uh, uh, restriction for the companies in the state, which uh, uh, reduces the the capacity allowed to be working with uh, to 60 percent and we have our own uh, uh, status uh, red and orange are not exactly the ones that are declared uh, by the federal government uh, depending on the local situation the government establishes the, the what status we have so in red and orange we have a restriction of 60% of capacity. So all those type of restrictions that are external to the company, but it, that uh, require a immediate uh, a, a attention in order to understand how that will uh, uh, reduce your capacity to, to deliver to your customers, right? So there might be mobility restrictions, there, there might be safety measures that are required uh, by local uh, authorities, uh, capacity restrictions, as I was saying, or logistic restrictions. So you have to understand them very well. Uh, let me say that we understand uh, all the companies that all these measures are meant to secure the health and, and safety of our people. And that is the main goal in these times to keep them safe above anything else, right? So that's, we have to keep always that in mind. The second thing, once you have uh, that assessed would be how that impact and how the, the, the COVID uh, situation is impacting your workforce. Despite the safety measures that were implemented, we may have uh, medical absences uh, or either because they have, people has uh, vulnerability factors or because they are already ill or because they are suspect to be ill because a, a family member or and they have to be away of the workplace being monitored and, and taking care of the health. So 
In all those cases, you need to have a strategy in order to keep the correct uh, quantity and level of uh, qualified personnel to support the production uh, on, uh, and even more on those uh, special positions that have specific training or certifications. So once you have that, the other factor that you need to assess is uh, which products are at risk based on that reduced uh, capacity that you have or the restrictions that you have. So uh, once you uh, identify those uh, products that might be at risk uh, or represent a, a risk uh, for your customer, you need to find a backup plan on that. And there are many ways to do that, but uh, the customer will always expect from us to mitigate all the risks that uh, may cause them a line stoppage. So uh, that, that, that's uh, from your capacity uh, restrictions perspective, but uh, even more, you have to understand, and, and here comes again the global uh, factor, you have to understand what extra capacity you have and see if you can be helpful to other regions that might be in trouble. So that is also an opportunity, right? The fourth factor would be to evaluate your, uh, the, the impact to your cost structure. So right now the cash flow and, and, and profitability are key to business survival. So you need to understand how your cost structure has been impacted and you need to start immediately to look for cost reduction measure, uh, measures and in order to overcome the impact of the new costs that you're having. And the fifth one would be a flexibility. I mean, the only company that is gonna survive is gonna be the one that is able to adapt. And that's uh, something that we have seen through many crises, not only this one. So you need to be aware of all the possible scenarios that you have, see how your operation can react and adapt to them in terms of operation size or in terms of a the operation methods understands which options you have for a quick response and you have to consider all resources available uh, local resources not only within your company but local resources that can give you a, 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 the ability to respond quickly to an eventuality because uh, some uh, uh, regular uh, suppliers or, or, or support that you have might be compromised in another region. So you have to develop a plan B, let's say, in order to keep, to keep that flexibility uh, and, and support your customers with, with, the, with the product. Thank you very much, Tarcicio. Uh, now, Alejandro. You uh, just talk about Mexican automotive industry in general in, uh, in, in our country, but now uh, how is USMCA effective, affecting the automotive industry in your region? Okay, well, my region, which is uh, San Luis Potosí, is not only a, a small region, it's the whole Bajio region. And the Bajio is um, comprised by five states. And if we add all those five states, we are already talking about 25% at least, if not 30% of the industrial, in, of the automotive industrial activity in Mexico. So we can see that uh, the region has many OEMs. I would say that region-wise, we have the majority of the OEMs in, in the country. But we also have a, a big amount of tier ones. Now the challenge are the tier twos and the tier threes. Those two levels are very narrow. Uh, unfortunately, we in Mexico do not have the pyramid figure that uh, other countries have, where the tier three are the majority of the companies. Um, in the US, which I'm also very familiar with, in Canada, uh, these tier three are normally family companies, uh, small shops, even uh, minority companies, which uh, the minority kind of, uh, of company is very much favored in the United States. So in Mexico, we don't have that. And we do not realize that our PMEs, 
uh, shall be that tier three level. And we shall promote, and uh, not only in the Bajio region, not only in SLP, but in the whole country, the way that the tier trees uh, work, how uh, the entrepreneurs can uh, invest more money and how they can be guided because what we have as main challenge is guiding these tier three companies. Uh, their owners are normally not very much familiar with the, uh, with how the automotive industry works. And that's why they have uh, continuously failures that lead uh, to closing their companies or even financial problems. So the challenge that we have is to promote the tier threes and even the tier two so that we can grow together and make this um, complete and continuous work um, throughout the, the, the chain of value and the chain of supply within the automotive industry. That is the main challenge that we have in the state and regionally speaking. Alejandro, thank you very much. And Gunther, uh, what are the efforts made by your region to improve Mexico's automotive industry, the value chain? Okay, so we're working with, with uh, very specific with the OEMs uh, and the tier ones, tier twos, uh, providing uh, new visions or new technology. Uh, we're facing a very volatile time in the automotive industry. We see all the shifting of the trade wars that are impacting the cost of the raw materials, but also there's a very in interesting part, the logistics, how we can link the logistics in a digital way that we can have the visibility door to door. One of the key OEMs in the state of Mexico is asking the cluster, the, the, um, the commission for, for high tech, how we can help them to provide a platform to see in their exports of their vehicles, how they can track by beam where the car is and not just linking the door to door operation to, to the distributors, also linking the financial aspect of this uh, supply chain, knowing that the car has arrived and then they can be paid automatically with linking this information through the financial aspects. But what has been the vision of, of this project that now they want to link the suppliers, tier ones, to know if the shipments will be arriving on time. If not, if something is happening during this uh, transportation process, what they can do, what's going to cost the solution, and also linking the financial aspects to pay the supplier. So this is a very interesting technology. And now with, with the new reality, cloud services are very important. We're able to talk to have the seminar because a cloud technology and also the cloud technology has been able, uh, enabling us to work from home uh, and looking what's happening in the shop floor. So that's something uh, the, the cluster of the state of Mexico with the high tech commission and, and and consulting services, we have been working with, with our members, how we can help them to be more agile uh, responding to any shift in the, in, the, in the market or in the industry and being able to respond faster. Gunther, thank you very much. And uh, Tarcicio, in Chihuahua in particular, what steps have companies taken to overcome additional government restrictions? Well, uh, the, the main restriction that is impacting the industry right now is the capacity restriction, as we were mentioning before. And, and uh, even more now that we have seen that the demand of the industry has been sustaining uh, pretty much at the same levels as before, uh, we have uh, no visibility on how that will last or if it will sustain, but right now it's an issue. The demand has sustained and we had an impact because of the downtime periods that we have had in, in the last uh, uh, month, 
and the government uh, of the state declare uh, also uh, two weekends of uh, uh, downtime for all the industry. So for the companies that have a, a 24 seven or, or, or every day operation, that is a challenge, right? Um, so um, how that challenge has been addressed? And uh, well, some of the companies uh, that have a uh, demand above that percentage have uh, extended the work shifts. Uh, so if they were having a one shift operation, they moved to two. If they had two shift operation, they moved to the weekends operation. And that has been a way to increase the capacity with uh, meeting the current uh, uh, restriction. Why? Because the, the idea behind the, the restriction is to reduce the, the amount of people that is working at the same time in, in the facility. So that has been a way to overcome that uh, restriction, uh, but also this represents additional costs uh, as we were talking about that before, uh, that represents to increase your cost structure. Um, the other way to overcome that is to look at your bottleneck operations and, and uh, uh, increase the capacity on those specific uh, uh, steps of your process. That also may represent a cost increase, but is uh, better than uh, failing to deliver on time to your customers. Uh, the best uh, uh, way to, to uh, address this is obviously to accelerate any investment or improvement activity that can allow you to increase uh, the efficiency, the first pass yield, uh, or eliminate the downtimes in, 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 in the bottleneck uh, steps of your processes. And that would translate immediately in extra capacity and cost reduction. So that, that, that has been in, in the hands of the companies. Uh, the government house has also issued what they call uh, Empresa de Valor or Value Company Certificate, which allow the companies to run up to 80%. So uh, that uh, allows you to deal only with a 20% gap if you still 100% of demand through the, the activities that I was just mentioning before. In very extreme cases, the companies are looking for if they're moving orders to other regions where they have the same capabilities or moving production temporarily. Uh, but these have been very, very uh, few cases uh, where the companies have, have to do this, very, very few. So we'll still uh, see that the industry in the state has been able to keep up with the pace of these restrictions. Um, other other examples are the transportation restrictions where uh, they are allowed to, to uh, transport 50% of the capacity of the buses. So companies have to invest in, in using more uh, uh, buses. But again, all these restrictions are in order to protect our people. So it's part of the new reality that we have to face and we have to learn to work with. Okay, Tarcicio, thank you very much. Well, here I have a question of Jose Oviedo, and he said, uh, he says, hi, everyone. Thank you for your presentation. I see uh, there, there, there is very good efforts to unify synergies and best practices, but the new normality is forcing to prioritize the safety and business continuity plans, which do you think will be the key topic ahead or the key topics ahead for cluster members. I don't know if Tarcisio Gunter of Alejandro uh, want to answer these questions. Which do, which do you think will be the key topics ahead for cluster members? If, uh, you uh, want... Gunter, ah, go ahead. Thank you, Fabiola. Uh, the, the, the reason Elisa Crespo is not here with us uh, and asked me to, to, to take her place is because she's working right now with uh, Maestra Marteila Gonzalez and working this topic, how we can be sure that, that the labor, the, the workforce, the, the personnel in, in the plants are safe working now with 
with COVID. And this faces a, a lot of efforts from, from the members to know that they need to provide the, the distance measure between every operator and now how we can provide a, as the cluster this link of communication between the company with the unions and, and the government to make sure we're providing a safe environment for all or for all, all of our workers in, in, in the industry. Mm -hmm. And also we can we can also bet on, on technology with the in, in artificial intelligence, we can also track by uh, sensing every person that comes into, into the plant who could be possible ill and take the actions to, to avoid any, any spread of the COVID in our, in our work, uh, work centers. Uh, it's a very important thing that Elisa is taking care of directly. And that's uh, something all, all the cluster members are very happy for, for, for having her taking this, this in place. Good, Gunther. Thank you very much. Alejandro, we have a question uh, from Susana Gama. And, uh, and that, that is the one that I was reading, and I think it's a very interesting question. Yes, well, it's very interesting. Uh, let, me, let me read. Yes, uh, considering the local content quota of 35%, what are, the, what are the activities, programs, or programs that the cluster have on hand to communicate? promote and support their associate, associates to have access to suppliers and sub suppliers located in Mexico? How can those small and medium sized companies have access to the tiers and OEMs to announce the, their technologies and capabilities? Well, let me go step by step. First, uh, we have to reach the 75% in four years. So we still have time. Second, uh, the way that we are approaching the sub suppliers in the supply chain is to make uh, this year, uh, unfortunately, virtual um, promotions. I think that each state, uh, I know that the state of Mexico, the state of Guanajuato, Querétaro, San Luis Potosí, Chihuahua, have made efforts to reach um, to different supplier levels so that they can come to these um, uh, let's say, uh, first, uh, virtual first, and offer their products. We just closed um, one um, two weeks ago, which was closed distance. And closed distance was also directed to all the suppliers and, and potential suppliers in Mexico. That was um, a, a very much promoted uh, together with the INA, which is the National uh, uh, Association of Auto Partes, uh, and we have uh, made efforts in, in, in getting these sub suppliers tier two, tier three, close to, closer to the tier one now. But the challenge is not only to get them closer to the tier ones, the main challenge is make the tier twos and tier threes understand what the automotive industry requires. I mean, quality wise, volume wise, cost wise is a challenge in all three levels. So if the tier threes or the tier twos do not understand what the challenges are and that they need to get trained, they need to get educated, they just cannot open a company and think that they can supply to any tier one who supplies Mercedes or, or Nissan or Audi or whatever without being trained. And I think that the major problem in Mexico is that the company owners of tier threes and some tier twos do not understand that they need training. They cannot just get there and supply the automotive industries. So please to all tier trips and then tier twos for 2021, you must put in your budget a big amount of training. Otherwise, we will not make it. Okay, that is the main challenge, training. That is the, the code word, the password, to be able to reach the 75 percent okay alex thank you very much and the last question for uh, for tarcisio uh, this question is from thomas mox mosching and he asked uh, he said uh, you said that foreign foreign investment is important these days 
which companies with which technologies should be attracted? Yeah, well, no, actually, I, I didn't say foreign investment. I said investment. Every company knows where to move in terms of improving their own processes and their, and, and their own networking, uh, logistics, all the aspects. So what I'm saying is that we need to accelerate those investments uh, in terms of uh, uh, those that can give you capacity. Uh, and I was talking about the specific case of Chihuahua where you have that restriction, right? But uh, we have seen some uh, intentions of some companies to bring uh, uh, production to the state. And uh, that is because the same situation that we're facing here is being faced uh, all over the world. And uh, uh, there are uh, regions where they are, are, are having even more trouble, right? So um, uh, I saw another question there also saying that, that uh, how many companies have already taken part of their production from Chihuahua? It's not companies uh, are just sending maybe a specific per numbers where they have constraints, but have been very few. And, and, and again, this is a related to the main issue that is affecting, which is the capacity restriction in the state. Okay, thank you, Tarcicio. Well, uh, we are within time to start closing this panel. Alejandro, Tarcicio, and Gunter, any final comments you would like to express? I think that we have to go beyond, sorry, Gunter, beyond the COVID. We have to think that COVID is part of our current conditions and go beyond it. And when I say go beyond it is work towards a much safer environment, uh, work within our companies to have a better efficiency, Tarsisio was talking about it, uh, what we call within the industry, the OEE uh, is a must. I mean, we have to reach levels of 75, 80%. Whoever thinks that we can have an OEE beyond 95%, that would be a perfect world. So 95 and, and beyond, just take it away. But if we would have 75 to, to 90%, it would be very good. So we have to be efficient. In Mexico, we can work 48 hours a week, even 60 hours a week the efficiency equals 30 hours. So we have to be realistic. We have to start um, thinking, not dreaming. So we have to get to efficiency levels where we can be a, not only one supplier, one OEM, but the, the real nation within the world uh, that has the preference uh, to be the manufacturing nation for the automotive industry worldwide. So Mexico can get there, we have to get there with efficiency. Good, Alejandro, thank you very much. Uh, Gunter. Yes, uh, I would like to complement uh, the answer from Alejandro on the local content is that uh, for companies willing to, to join the automotive industry and also for the current members, come and, and, and approach the, the local clusters in the case uh, of state of Mexico, Mexico City, you can join the, the state of Mexico cluster. And we have a continuous uh, supplier development program mm -hmm. that starts with the OEMs and tier one's supplier needs. So they are sharing what kind of uh, technology, components, parts they're willing to locate in Mexico. And with that, and very interesting answer, very real answer from Alejandro Cava, a long-term vision. This is not going to be an easy and a fast business, but once you get a contract for a program, if you make it right, you work on your certifications, quality and logistics, it's going to be a, a long-term But stay close to the, to the clusters, work with the clusters. And, and in our case, we have a business, uh, supplier development program that we can help from contacting OEMs, tier ones to know the requirements, work with you on the certification programs, and we can work with you on the manufacturing process and how to be successful in the industry. Thank you very much, Gunther. And finally, Tarcicio. 
Yeah, well, I would like to close saying that we need to adapt and prepare to the new reality, keeping health and safety first. Even if we get an, a, a temporary solution like a vaccines, this is gonna keep going, right? So, but also the automotive industry will still evolve despite the situation. The electrical cars are coming, connectivity with the environment is not only coming, but will be increasing the scope with this situation. We have to find a way to have a, a practices like home office to be more effective, more productive, Working culture must change to speed up innovation and process improvements. The cluster needs to be a, 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 an enabler for regional governments in order to develop uh, practical policies that allow economical activities to be reactivated and even grow in this uh, environment. Academy and government and uh, us need to find a way to solve the bureaucratic barriers that we need to achieve an excellence educa in the education level and in advanced technologies. And uh, in general, as a society, we need to increase our safety culture and be responsible inside and outside of the workplaces. Tarcicio, thank you very much. Well. Uh, we want to thank the participation of Gunter. Gunter, thank you very much for being here. Alejandro, thank you very much for being here. And Tarcicio, Tarcicio, thank you very much. And all of you for your time. Uh, Mexico Now, thanks for the, for the invite. And have a good day. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you. And any questions that may have been open and not closed, please send them uh, via email so that we can close them out and answer them. Yeah. Thank you. Right.